Well, you know, it is absolutely back to what we talked about in terms of the purpose. And uh, that, you know, the strategy 2030 is about us being more relevant, more focused for people now to share stories with people now in terms of what the RAF is doing, has done, is going to be. So it is absolutely about how we continue to um, really share those stories in an inspiring way, opening and honestly, and then the building blocks of how we're going to do that in terms of you know what we're physically changing on science. Welcome to the Damcast Tips, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Many, many moons ago, when your dear podcast host here was a mere slip of a lad, 12 years old, having been dragged out of Canada and deposited here in what I've come to consider the greatest city on earth, he says from outside the greatest city on earth from deepest, darkest Sussex. We did basically all the museums in the summer holidays of 1990. And one sunny day, we were at the RAF Museum London at the Hendon site. And I walked around a corner and there she was in her wonderful glory, Hawker Typhoon MN235. And an obsession began so a couple of weeks ago, I returned to Hendon and <laughs> took my wife and introduced her to the incredible Hawker Typhoon. And as only a wonderful Scotswoman could do, she couldn't really see what all the fuss was about, having put up with my obsession for five years. But there's a lot more going on at the RAF Museums, both here in London and in the Midlands at Cosford. So it was a great pleasure to sit down with the CEO, Maggie Appleton, and discuss the museum, what they have going on, what the purpose of the museum is, and of course the strategy for 2030, which did cause a lot of debate on the interwebs, of which I was guilty once again of probably saying a few things that I didn't quite understand. So it was great to put the questions to Maggie. We sat down, we had a cup of tea, and we had to start at the beginning, really, to find out a bit about Maggie and where her journey in the museum game began. And I suppose the first question, as we said, we'd enter with was, how did you end up in the museum game? Because everyone comes to it from lots of different, different angles. What, what's your story? Gosh, well, in museums generally, I've been uh, in museums for 30 odd years uh, now, but I came in Actually, as many do as a volunteer. So I, having having uh, gone to university and done a history degree via other routes first, because university wouldn't have necessarily been a family thing for us, um, I I then went and got a you know a proper job, nice job, and was doing some voluntary work at museums, just thinking I'd keep that love of history alive mm. in my spare time, and then did the. Oh, but do you know what? I could actually do this in real life and get paid for it. So I went back and did a Master's in Heritage Management and got my first job at the Tower of London when, it, the, when the Royal Armouries was there before it moved to, um, up to Leeds. So that's how it started. It was just a love and passion I've had from, of history since I was teeny tiny. So, so was it the armories that dragged you down to London or were you here before? No, I was already down here. After my master's, I got a job. My job before I worked in museums was Northampton, Peterborough. So mm. I was sort of down this. And it was that thing, you know, you go where the work is. So, And then that was the first museum job came up and it was all about, you know, getting you, getting started, getting your foot in the door. But social history was my absolute love and passion and people history. So... Having been the assistant registrar at the Royal Armouries, I then the, my perfect job came up, which was assistant curator at Stevenage Museum. And from there, a couple of different jobs there, then in Luton and then here. But it's always been about people history mm. and the fantastic objects and collection. All of them are, are about people at the end of the day. Oh, yes. A, a, a big object is nothing until you have someone playing around with it and then it has a story. Absolutely, and that's why, you know, I, I stand and the hairs on the back of my neck go up when I stand in front of our Lancaster and it's thinking about those incredible crews and, you know, that aircraft almost feels almost feels alive in, in itself when you start thinking about those stories. It's tremendous. Yeah. We should mention it because you've had a bit of an incident in old 
Hangar 5, haven't you? Oh, gosh, yeah, we have. We had a flood last Sunday. I was actually on the way up to our site in Cosford mm. in the Midlands and got the call from our ops, head of ops here. So we'd had one of those horrendous flash, flush, mm. flash floods and the water came up under the floor. So hopefully we'll be back open in a few days, but we've lost all the electrics there. And that's the struggle that all museums are having generally. It's with our buildings, with our infrastructure, not enough capital invested in it. So it is a constant challenge. And we've really been trying over the last five plus years to look at a sensible investment plan for our infrastructure because it's not looking after the collection if we're having things like that going on. So. We were just talking to, to Her Harry Raphael and he's saying, luckily everything's prepared for some water. So you haven't, nothing's been damaged, you're all, you're uh, all good we're to go. All, all good there, and our team are just extraordinary in the way that they respond to mm -hmm. it and have the kits ready to pull out and, and do the work on. But, you know, what we want to be in the position is that things are in place so that that doesn't happen in the first place. So, yeah, more work needed. Super. Well, we're going to come back to the investment plan in a bit. But how did you end up here? Ah, uh, well, so I've been here eight and a half plus years now, Goodness. crikey. Yeah. Um, it's gone in a heartbeat and um, and it really was the job coming up and me knowing the museum as a visitor. Mm -hmm. I used to bring my lads there when they were little um, and loving the museum as a place to visit and it just being the right time. I'd been at Luton for 12 years, six as head of museums and six as chief exec of the mm -hmm. broader ch charity that had community centres, libraries, art centres and two museums and to come to you know, a national museum, actually, mm -hmm. and one whose collection is just eye-watering and mouth-wateringly brilliant, um, and to one that I've loved as a visitor and felt there was a lot of potential to, to, to do more with was just a fantastic opportunity. Fantastic. Let's do the sort of round robin -y question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the RAF Museums? Because you've got multiple sites, you've got the store mm. as well. I guess, what is the museum's purpose for, for those that yeah. want to know a little bit more than it's just a museum about the RAF? Yeah, well, I, and it is absolutely, we're here to share the RAF story. And that's the story of the people, that's the story at war and at peace, mm. with all the fantastic objects, of course, because we're a museum that really help us share that story. So it is all about storytelling. It's all about the people of the RAF mm. over 105 years now. And really importantly for us, it's about that contemporary story and looking into the future. Because as a national museum, of course, it's our responsibility to collect now, make sure there isn't a today-shaped hole in that mm -hmm. history, so that collecting today's history is really important to us as well. So how do the sites differ? Do, 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 do they have slightly different purposes, or is it sort of one for the north and one for the south? Well, please don't call Midlands the North, because you know as a Northerner... Oh, yeah, of, of course, there you go, put me foot in already. No, it is my, it is my favourite little uh, uh, jest, that one. So, um, I, I guess the, the easy answer is the purpose is the same, to share that amazing story. Um, but they are different, it's fascinating. So, we've got one collection, it, it's one collection, one team, um, one story, but actually the sites are very different, as mm -hmm. you know, and we share the sort of stories in slightly different ways and different emphases. Um, the, the populations are slightly different as well, so we do slightly different things, but that, I think the key thing is that we share the whole RAF story at both. Um, uh, here, of course, in London, we've got our whole hangar there that's the First World War story, mm -hmm. absolutely incredible, which we tell in a much smaller way at, at Cosford, our Midlands site. Yep. Um, whereas at Cosford, we have a whole hangar telling that incredible Cold War story, of course, with all three V bombers mm -hmm. and the lightning. Whereas here again, we just tell it in a smaller way. So it's a tiny percentage of our visitors that go to both. Fewer than 5% of our visitors go to both. So it's really important that we tell a full story at both. And something like the Second World War story, which is you know, of course, many people will really gravitate to that as an RAF story. So we tell that fully at both. And absolutely, we should be sharing the current story at both. More work in progress onto the future when we talk about the future for Midlands. Um, so, so it is about a complete comprehensive story um, told through the lens of people in our incredible collection, but with different emphases. Fantastic. And if you haven't been to Cosford, dear listener, or... Royal Air Force Museum Midlands, yep. as it is now, as we are at Royal Air Force Museum London, not Hemden, 
Got to get my head around that. I, can yes. I say, actually, yeah. I, I will always, and everybody's very welcome to call Cosford, Cosford, Hendon, Hendon, and they are our loves for our, for our public. So for people who might be coming into London who don't know us, for one thing, you know, don't get off at Hendon because that's not where we are. And another thing, if, if you don't know London, it sounds you, you will be misled in terms of what we are as a museum. And that's even more so for Cosford because RAF Museum Cosford, from asking people, people felt that might be a small volunteer run museum. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually RAF Museum Midlands, to people perhaps living in Birmingham or Wolverhampton, it says, this is part of you, this is yours. But so it's partly to help to understand for our communities what it is and that it's theirs and part of, you know, a, a, a wider region. But it, it's absolutely not bound to say Hendon Cosford and we should carry <laughs> on doing that. And of course, at, for, for those of your listeners who haven't been to Cosford, absolutely, it is just an amazing site. So please do come. And because we're next to a working RAF base, that's the dif another yeah. difference between the sites, of course. So you'll wander around there and there'll be RF people walking around because they've popped in for a cup of tea. And of course, it's a bigger footprint mm -hmm. of a site too. So the two sites physically feel different, but I hope there's a feeling of RAF heritage just walking around both sites too. I, I, I very much think so. And I think that sort of leads nicely to the question about how, how has things changed in your eight years and a bit here? Because I can remember coming here as I was saying, long time ago, dear listener. Um, and there's a lot that I recognise and a lot mm. that I don't. How has things changed over your time here in that sort of vision? Because I suppose the demographic is changing as well. Absolutely. And, and you know, it is really interesting because we're working in the context of our times, aren't we? Where mm. so many people now, I mean, most people of my age, I think you're a bit younger, but anyway, um, we'll have, you know, family that were in the RAF and we remember it. My dad was in Bomber Command and man on the ground, he was an armourer. But so many people now are less connected with that. So, you know, and, and hence for us, it's all about making sure that those stories are still relevant for everyone. And, you know, which is part of us telling the contemporary story. The RAF's busier than ever it's ever been, of course, with Ukraine and all that's going oh, on yeah. there, as well as the humanitarian stuff that it does. Um, so uh, it, it is about remaining contemporary and relevant in very changing times. And actually, in terms of how we've changed, it was, I think my appointment was part of that from our board of trustees, because mm -hmm. our chair, when I was appointed, was a former chief of Earth staff, and I've had the, uh, the most amazing privilege to work for three different now chairs who've all been former chiefs of the air staff of the RAF. But it was um, uh, Sir Glenn Torpey, who was our chair at the time, who was very much a, this is a Royal Air Force Museum and we should be sharing stories about the Royal Air Force at war, at peace, across. So I think their appointment of me as not a military historian, I'm a, you know, a social historian, a person historian who, who you know, is... Uh, uh, in love with objects and material culture and bringing those stories out and the more that anyone gets immersed in RAF history the more you fall in love with the subject with all its complexity and challenges and that's part of the joy of the subject so uh, in terms of back to your question in how has it changed I think it, it has been more of how can we celebrate the collection in even more ways so that someone who is interested in aircraft per se can still come and and see and explore the aircraft and find out about the the facts of the aircraft but equally as a general visitor who may not have an RAF connection who may not be an enthusiast about aircraft and most of our visitors just come for a free day out mm -hmm. and perhaps we turn them into enthusiasts actually um, it is about coming in and going crikey these objects tell amazing stories and that's how we fold people into the collection and into the stories and I hope they might go away and start perhaps they buy a book in the shop on the way out or or go to another of our brilliant um other aircrafts or RAF related museums or 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 even you know just get a bit more involved and interested in history and learning more so that's part of our role in the museum sector I think yeah and I, I suppose it's interesting to see because it's the last day of school holidays today. So it's 
Lo yeah. Lots of little people. You've got you've got the horrible histories team in with doing doing their thing as well. It's a fun spread of people having a look around the museum today yeah. and got trampled by some little ones who saw a fire truck, which was far more interesting than the airplanes, which I can kind of get. <laughs> but I, I guess that's 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 the thing. You're, it's getting people in and, and letting them find a passion that hooks them to bring yeah. them back. And, and, you know, and we all engage in different ways. So it's, you know, there is something here for, for you, all of you, whatever your interest, I hope. So, yeah. Wonderful. So we, we've been talking about the sort of changing place of the RAF, the RAF being mm. in, incredibly busy over the time. How does the museum adapt to stay relevant to that? Because you mentioned before that for most of us on our first visit, we were of an age that we had family that, perhaps served mm. or, or the like. So the storytelling might have been a bit different, that yeah. I was in this, I worked on that, and then it was, you know, your uncle did this, th things, things like that. Given we're essentially a generation on from then, yeah. how, how does the museum, I don't want to say pivot, because that's day job sort mm. of word, but how does it pivot to stay relevant in a time when perhaps some of the things that the RF are being asked to do are not as popular yeah. as they once were. It's really interesting, isn't it, that question? Because, you know, in many ways, I think that history, and when I started, I, I had the amazing um, experience of meeting First World War veterans as well, and how things have changed so quickly, haven't they, in, in, in many ways. But those stories are still incredibly important, and the Second World War legacy is still incredibly important mm -hmm. for us. And, you know, it is that whole thing about, you know, History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, and we all need to continue to learn, and it doesn't make it any less important, the fact that it's further away. So it's how we engage people in those parts of the story in a way that, you know, we can't expect people just to come and see an aircraft and understand what it is now. We've got to share that in a way that is quite immediate for them without writing big books on walls. Yes. You know, back to that, how, how much attention span have you? but equally sharing the more recent stories. And, and, and your story there, if you go in Hangar 6 here um, at our London site, you know, you'll see the prisoner of war outfit worn by one of the first Iraq RAF prisoners of war, which is one of the most moving objects in the collection. So sharing those stories too, and those are stories that actually probably people aren't nearly so aware of. And, um, you know, so I, 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 we've also got a both sides. We live stream into the RF media and comms people, give us their stories to keep them up to date. Um, we have a, a board in Hangar 6 that we can move along so we can keep adding the current things. But I, I have to say what I've found um, most surprising possibly and reassuring as a museum curator from working mm -hmm. with the RF is that there is absolutely no pressure to tell a story in a, in a, a, a way that's, you know, this is the way the tale's got to be told. And the response we've had from the RAF is, we should tell stories honestly and openly because that's the way that the, the, the public will trust us more. And that's really important for museums because they, in the list of what the public trust, mm -hmm. museums still come out pretty high. And if we're, any museum is just seen to be a mouthpiece of whether it's a town or a city and, and, and saying everything's perfect or a museum like ours, then that's where you lose the trust. And we've got great support to being honest, but sensitive mm -hmm. in the way, in, you know, in the way that we share those stories. So it, telling, the, I, I guess, the, the blunt question is, mm. it, it's being a sensitive recruiting tool to show the RAF story or is it not? That is, that, do you know that's something else that comes up a lot and our chair, current chair of trustees, former chief of their staff, if anybody says you recruit, he's absolutely not. He's so adamant that we aren't and we shouldn't be. But of course when people come in, if they are, if they feel, blimey what an interesting story, there are, you know, the current head of Space Command says that he joined the RAF from coming to the museum. So it will work that way because people are interested. I hope it might also make people, um, perhaps small children, think, well, do you know what, this engineering lot, because I've had my hands on it, mm -hmm. I'm really engaged with it. Actually, I might pay a bit more attention at school on that, or some of the programmes. We do this fantastic summer residential camp 
at Cosford where young people come in and in immerse, immerse for a week on it. It's completely free because it's sponsored. So whatever your economic background, you can, you can do it. And, you know, people go away from that and say, do you know what I'm really thinking about becoming an engineer? Or, or perhaps it's just, you know, as in, you know, for me as a historian, going away feeling enthused and interested. So uh, we are definitely not here as a recruiting tool, but that will, I hope, be an outcome for some people because they are absolutely amazed and fulfilled by some of the stories. Of course, a tiny percent of people are air crew mm -hmm. in the RAF, but I hope we also share um, stories that, you know, you can actually become a cook, you can be an yeah. administrator, there's all sorts of great jobs you can be doing that is contributing to the Royal Air Force. Because it is noticeable that there isn't a desk with, with someone sat behind it saying sign up here. That, that if, dear listener who's never been here, that's not, not what that, this place is. That right? is not what we're here for. Yeah. And of course, we're free as a national mm. museum. That's government policy. Both sites were free. And it is about being here for everyone. And that I think that's what my passion is about. I feel as a national museum, we receive granting aid from the government and, and massively, massively uh, welcome and appreciate that. It's not enough to keep our doors open. So we have to, you know, make money in the shops and cafes and fundraising and all that as a charity as well. But our responsibility as a recipient of public money is to be here for absolutely everyone. And, and so we, we take that very, very seriously. So we, we've talked a, a lot about many different things. But what does a day for you look like as the CEO of the National Museum? Because you, you, you must be spread a bit thin to cover the, the national aspect of it, mm. but then the focus aspect of the day-to-day -day running yeah, of the museum. And it's, it is... It's a great question because no two days are the same. And that's the joy that, you know, keeps us coming to work every day. It is the greatest joy. And of course, we've got two sites, 130 miles apart, probably spend fairly equal time at, at both. Uh, but then I'm often out and about meeting stakeholders and, you know, funders. And, you know, I went to, I remember being quite a young curator going to um, something at a Museums Association conference that was directors talking and actually saying that probably you spend 50% of your time fundraising, 70% when you're doing a big mm -hmm. programme. So a lot of my role, it's not about, you know, not that much money with a, a begging bowl, but actually in terms of engaging with people out and about, it's very externally focused. But equally, um, the, you know, it, 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 there is a huge part of the job that is thinking about how we're running, how we are you know, almost the personality mm -hmm. of the organisation, I think, is, you know, a lot of that is my responsibility. We've got an amazing team, though, so it isn't that I've got to do it all. We've got a great leadership team, a great management team, a fantastic curatorial team who absolutely know our, our collection inside and out. And, you know, my role often is how to make their jobs easier and better and more fun so that actually we're giving the public the best visit they can have. So actually my, my job's a, a, a joy. It's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's nights when I don't sleep, but, <laughs> but actually I have these, these mental weighing scales that put all the stuff that keeps me awake at night or irritates me or I find frustrating on one side and then the joy on the other. And when, you know, when you're having a bad day, I, I, I wait up and the joy always outweighs anything else. And sitting here and looking out, uh, we're sat here, dear listeners, looking out at our side, at visitors just, you know, talking to each other, engaging, and, and you know, just looking out of the window does it for me. And if that doesn't, I'd just go and stand in front of the Lancaster and have a little cry and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> that that was one of the questions was, was which which aircraft do you go to sneak out and see? It's the Lancaster. Then, isn't well, it? it depends where I am as well. Right. So here it's the the Lancaster does it. My my dad was um, yep. worked on Lancasters. He died when I was tiny, so I didn't get his stories. So it's, it was not a reason for me working here. I we, I knew nothing about him until I came here in terms of that. Apart from me loading bombs onto planes in the war, Margaret is what all my <laughs> mum told me. I know so much more now. It's brilliant. If I'm at Cosford, it's Bravo November every time. Mm -hmm. So who, um, of course, was our fantastic new acquisition 
last year, the amazing Chinook, who four crew, one distinguished flying crosses. Um, you know, the only Chinook to survive the sinking of the Atlantic conveyor. All of them went down with the Atlantic conveyor. She was in the air at the time. Worked every day of the Falklands War apart from one. I think all the supplies had gone down too, so I think they kept it together with elastic bands and sticky back plastic. I mean, she, just amazing, and has fought in every campaign since. So the story, back to the stories that that aircraft holds it, utterly remarkable. So I think if you gave me a big pair of cargo pants to steal to, um, <laughs> to aircraft, I'd have one in each side, with lots of the other collection as well, which, you know, it's not all about the aircraft. They're a big part of it, but there's lots of other amazing objects. You can squeeze those in your parachute pants. I'll, I'll take the typhoon. Um, <laughs> have you been, you've been to visit her today? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Introduced my wife to it for the yeah, first time. Yeah, yeah. She, she wasn't, she couldn't see the, the fuss over my obsession. So. Do you like where she's, she's quite prominent. She's lovely, yeah. She? Yeah, yeah. It was nice, I sort of, I caught, I caught a glimpse as I walked in. And I was like, oh, so I sort of shuffled her around so that she didn't see it. To be fair, she was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, she's had to put up with a lot, but I think she's very patient. Clearly, she's a wonderful yeah. woman. And when she when she listens, she's a viewer and listener, which is great. Let's talk about the future, <laughs> because one of the things that Scott and I chatted about, Scott Marchand at Pima and, and some of the others, is noise, which is. Mm -hmm those of us sat on, on the, the tinternets complaining about decisions yeah. and things. One of the things that did come out, which is the strategy 2030 for mm. the, the next 10 years, having, which is sat here on, on the desk. My day job's business analyst, worked in aviation, mm. I, I now work in exhibitions. I've been involved in teams who've written strategy mm. documents and things like that. And they're written for a very certain audience usually. There was some noise about what did it mean. There was the respect bit, I think it was, there's elements there. Inspire, that was Inspire. Yeah, was yeah. That. For those people who have listened and have asked me to ask this question, mm. from your point of view, what's the elevator pitch for the strategy 2030 going forward? As we can come on to the COVID question, because that's probably not helped with yeah. some of the targets there, but yeah. what is the vision that the strategy document lays out? And what, yeah, what's, what's the pitch? Well, you know, it is absolutely back to what we talked about in terms of the purpose. And uh, that, you know, the strategy 2030 is about us being more relevant, more focused for people now to share stories with people now in terms of what the RAF is doing, has done is going to be so it is absolutely about how we continue to um really share those stories in a, an inspiring way opening and honestly and then the building blocks of how we're going to do that in terms of you know what we're physically um changing on sites because it's it's one of those things i suppose that when you're a fan and you show up, you mm. want to look at airplanes and you, know, you want to get as close to them as you can. Looking at the business, we don't tend to see the business side mm. of, of a museum. So how, does, how do the elements of, of balancing telling that story versus say the, the funding, which is a difficulty for all, mm. all, all museums, especially one that's a national museum. How does the vision make it possible for you to keep telling that that story because as we're saying people are changing attention spans are changing yeah how do you try to cater for that yeah and you know in some ways that that is a challenge because mm -hmm. things are changing people are changing and I you know we talk a lot and our trustees talk a lot about people's expectations in terms of mm -hmm. digital and you know what people can can do at home but but actually in some ways I think it, it's you know, back through my 30 years career, there's always been a... When I started working on exhibitions, you know, in my early 20s, we talked about we can't be hands-on brains off with mm -hmm. people. So, you know, it isn't just about putting in an interactive... Act. And it's the same true now, whether you're talking about a lift-up flap or a digital interactive. For me, all of those things should be how is the best way to present our story so that in many layers... So if you've just popped in for half an hour and really you just want to take your kids to the playground, but we might just 
catch your eye on your way out. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we ensure that at every different level people are just engaging? And, and you know, so any, you know, of your listeners and you who were, who were know about exhibition planning design, it's about having the headline for the people that are just walking past, you know, perhaps, or, or just the object with, you know, one statement. And then how we dig down with deeper layers so that, you know, our visitors who really do know their onions mm -hmm. um, can can still really engage and learn more. And then that is tricky to to fulfil my aspiration of being here for absolutely everyone, whether you are a specialist uh, either in the RAF or aircraft or whether you're here just for a grand day out or you've nipped into use the toilet, you know, mm -hmm. actually you're, you're welcome. And how can we do something for everyone? And we have big enough sites that, that we, we should be able to still do that. And, you know, everyone says, oh, you can't be able to every people. Well, actually, it's our responsibility to try to do that as best we can. And we're not going to be successful all the time, but we should be trying to do it and not make any part of our audience feel disenfranchised by that. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. <laughs> Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, among our collection of kamikaze aircraft. Um, we have two versions of the Oka, which was a suicide rocket-powered human-guided bomb. This version here is the two-seat trainer version. We made a couple of them that were uh, launched on a catapult with one rocket engine that they would use to train uh, potential Oka pilots. Um, you have the instructor in the back and the student up front it technically could glide and they could land it back on the skid and you know learn how to fly the operational version of the aircraft. It also had a longer wingspan to allow it to uh, perform as a glider. The operational Oka right over here um, which is on loan from the Royal Air Force Museum. Um, the trainer version is actually on loan from the National Air and Space Museum. The operational Oka was an anti-shipping human guided suicide bomb. It would be loaded underneath a Japanese G4M Betty bomber. Um, it would be launched, had four, you know, three rockets in the back, if I recall correctly, and really only had about less than a minute, only maybe about, it was about 20 or 30 seconds worth of uh, actual flight time. And then it would kind of go into a terminal dive on, on a ship guided by the suicide or kamikaze pilot flying the aircraft. They weren't all that successful, um, not because of the design itself. The biggest problem being the fact that they were strapped on a Japanese Betty that had to get within about 20 miles of the American fleet, which meant most of them were shot down while still strapped on the Japanese bomber. Um, but they did have a few successes uh, off of Okinawa. So the aircraft behind it is a Nakajima KI-115 Tsurugi, which is another purpose-built kamikaze aircraft. During the war, the majority of kamikaze aircraft leading up to you know, the end of the war were mostly repurposed aircraft, so Zeros, Oscars, Bettys, Bells, etc. Um, with the Tsurugi, the Japanese Army Air Service was building an aircraft specifically designed from bottom up as a one-way mission kamikaze suicide special attack force aircraft. Um, the wings are made out of aluminum. The fuselage is essentially made out of the metal that's no different than you'd have in air ducting. That's why it's kind of rusted. The inside of the cockpit is all very rudimentary with like wooden, made out of wood, wood control stick and throttle, maybe three or four gauges at best. Um, the landing gear actually dropped off the aircraft so that they could repurpose them. Also, you know, it kind of forced, I will say it probably also force the Japanese pilot onto his, to complete his mission or attempt to complete his mission. So once you uh, drop the landing gear, the explosive or bomb that's armed underneath your aircraft, you're not exactly going to be able to belly land that aircraft without uh, destroying yourself in the aircraft. But this was kind of shows just like how desperate the Japanese were getting at the end of the war, just making these mass produced um, s kind of like simple built aircraft um, just so they could have the sheer numbers for them for the uh, what they expected to be the decisive invasion of Japan uh, with the uh, first in Kyushu and then Honshu 
but because of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hirohito, realizing that they could not go on any longer, that they decided to surrender to the United States, or and the Allies, I should say. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. So what, for those people who haven't read it, mm. what does 2030 look like to the team here that's, that's working towards that? What, 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 do this, what do the two sites look like in, does the math, seven, six years now, six, six and a half years? Do you mean physically look like? Because well, I, I think there's two things. I think, yeah. Yeah. Is, is it, is it, is it going to change physically or is it going to yeah. be more of that interpretation a, side a, that we're looking at? A, a, a bit of both. And mm -hmm. I think it starts off with, you know, back to what I said about, you know, I think part of my role is how the heart and soul and personality of the organisation mm -hmm. is. And I think that should go through like a stick of rock, whether it's about how we behave as colleagues with each other or how we're welcoming the public or online researchers. And for me, that's got to be about a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. and, and I have been obsessed from the very beginning of my uh, career working with collections that actually there's no point having collections if we're not sharing them. Yeah. There's just no point. And so for me, it starts with the personality of the museum, which I think sh absolutely we want to be a warm welcome and we're about sharing our collections with everyone. And from there is, well, what does that look like so that we've got a physical manifestation of that? Um, and um, as, as any of your listeners who visited in the last couple of years, even since COVID will know, during COVID we were doing new Battle of Britain exhibitions overlaying the interpretation mm -hmm. of both sites that, um, for the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain in 2020. That quite a big year there in terms of COVID, but we still did manage to open them towards the end of the year. And this year, again, we've overlaid our Bomber Command exhibitions with new interpretation. And it's not just new interpretation on the same objects. There's been a lot of shuffling around, but bringing more of our smaller objects out of, um, uh, out of store and being able to display them as well. So now our, our next exciting one is interwar exhibition. So we've got a new big part of the hangar mm -hmm. here in London. Um, that opens at Christmas sharing the uh, interwar story, the RF, which is another complex and interesting part of the history. Very complex, mm. especially when you get into the colonial Absolutely. policing aspects and success. Yep. And, and that was one of those questions I wasn't sure to ask, but if, if, you're, do, if you're doing it... We've got tea, we'll talk. Oh, we do, and biscuits. <laughs> and biscuits. Because yeah. that's fantastic to hear, because that is always one of those areas that people tend to jump over as yeah. they get towards, well, the Battle of Britain and Spitfires tends to be the, the big one. Why it's not hurricanes and things. He says sitting here in a Hawker Sibley t-shirt. That is fantastic to hear that mm -hmm. those sorts of aspects of the story that we'll call them unpalatable to some are going to be looked at because it is this vital thing because that's why the RAF stayed with us, that they found this role doing the colonial policing. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be delved into and looked at here in the London yep. side. That opens uh, first week of December. And of course, we're having long discussions with our panels and we've got, um, we've got a research advisory board mm -hmm. as well with academics on it and with, you know, RAF historians on it too, who were, you know, going over and I've gone over the text myself too mm -hmm. and going over the going, you know, are we being clear enough yeah. about, you know, ab about what the impact of this was? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's back to the, our earlier conversation in that, in terms of how, uh, how, you know, the RAF have those discussions with us in it. You know, we will always be sensitive, but they are complicated stories and they need to be told and shared. So, so yeah, it's um, December, come back, come and visit everybody. We shall, we shall do, I'm excited for that. Mm. So we've mentioned the C word. Yes. How did that impact the site? Well, so, of course, we closed, as all did, and uh, coordinated mainly with other national museums too. We closed mid-March, I think it was, mm -hmm. wasn't it? 2020, I can hardly remember. Um, so we closed, you know, closing down the museum is not something any of us came in to do. And we uh, reopened that first time in July. Um, so we, and then, of course, we closed twice more. Mm -hmm. So we were opening, closing, opening, closing. I think we dropped from... 
900,000 visitors across both sites a year to 191,000. Lost right. three million pounds of earned income. The RAF were brilliantly supportive. As, as, as our public mm. funding comes through them. But yeah, it was a real, real struggle. We were, then we were back to, um, we've grown back though, and visitors have come back really strongly and quickly. Right. And actually the, 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 the story that makes me think, so I was at our Midland site on the, I can't remember which I was at the first day we opened, I think it was at our Midland site, but we kept making sure that we were all at both sites to, to see everyone. And it was a few days after I was there again, and a chap came in pushing in his obviously very old elderly father in a wheelchair. And this was sort of the week after we'd reopened. Mm -hmm. And um, I checked him as in when he came in and he'd come in the week before, basically to do a recce to see if it felt safe enough to bring his dad oh. and he brought him back. And you know, when you go, do you know what? It, it's worth doing just for that one story. It, it was amazing. Our team were brilliant. And our, our, our mantra the whole way through is we want everyone to feel safe because the nervousness around, we've almost forgotten now, haven't we? Yeah. It was palpable, but we're not going to sanitise our welcome. And, and that was our, you know, how do we make sure we can still offer a really warm welcome while keeping everyone feeling safe? And of course, the, we do have the luxury of big spaces inside and out, which help massively. But, you know, our team were practising to reopen almost three weeks, you know, three weeks after we closed. So we put huge amounts of thought and rigour into how we were going to do that. But we are building back. So our visitors, um, in terms of the rest of the cultural sector, um, we've built back really, really well. And, and this year, we, we've just had a stunning summer. Hooray for rainy summers. Brilliant. <laughs> Bro, all my friends are going, oh, it's awful. Where's the sunshine? I'm going, hooray, bring on the rain. It's brilliant for these interviews. I'm not sure I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a bright side, though, you see, if you're making museums. <laughs> of course, yeah. Are there any lingering effects, say, like the impact of, mm. uh, on the, the roadmap? Well, to... of course, it shifted yeah. things because, you know, the money, it, it's, it shifted in terms of the money. So things, some things we're not going to be able to do as quickly as we would. Although our big plan, I've mentioned uh, some of our, how we're improve, trying to improve all the time in terms of new interpretation on site. But our, our big plan for the delivery of Strategy 2030 is our Midlands transformation mm -hmm. plan. That's still... That's still hitting the, the time frame. Costs, of course, the cost of living crisis and the price of raw materials and building materials mm. is the other massive thing because costs are spiralling. So, but we're, you know, so far the fundraising is going well and we're, we're absolutely on it. But the, our Midlands plan, which should be opening in summer 2027, it is really exciting, really, really exciting. So... Shall I outline it? Go for it, yes. So, in a few words, Hangar 1 will be completely reimagined new aircraft. Oh, so, Bravo November will be in there. Uh, that's going to be sharing uh, the contemporary history of the RAF and looking, to, in, looking into the future from 1980 to the present and into the future. So, we've got a hope waiting to come in, but we'll include space and cyber and all of that. Bravo November, of course, covers yeah. much of that period, so she <laughs> will be. Um, obviously one of the heroes and it's not favouritism I mean she just as I say is remarkable so uh, a, a big piece of storytelling it's a big hanger um, new learning centre in the front of that in terms of lifelong learning we basically in round terms welcome about 30,000 school children a year at each site mm -hmm. uh, we're turning children away um, uh, uh, in Cosford because we just can't fit them in so it'll enable us to engage more young people in our plan but those spaces will be used for lifelong learning opportunities as well um new landscaping new woodland mm -hmm. um spaces in there for learning inspiration helps our carbon net zero all of it we're planning sustainably and, the, and one of the really exciting parts of program for me is our main big store we've got two stores our we've got one behind the wire at mod stafford most of the collection we want to bring down on display in a new space in Cosford next to our wonderful conservation centre um, so that we'll be able to engage more people with our stored collection who never get to see it now. So really excited about that and be able to take it out more into communities for programmes as well. 
on that note, taking things out. So one of the things that's come up recently has mm. been the loans aspect has been yeah. curtailed. Is that part of that to make sure you have access to things for these projects mm. or is it just logistics? It, it, it's, it's really our team getting our house in order. Right. And um, one of our five priorities in, in strategy 2030 is about brilliant basics because we're wanting to improve and improve and improve but we've still got a lot of the basics that we've still got work to do and of course we've been borrowing and loaning out for 50 something years yeah. since we've been and actually you know frankly in some of it you know being clear about what we've got where it is how it's looked after is really important so the team at the moment are actually assessing all our loans looking at where they are both in and out so taking the time to do that is why they've paused, we've paused the mm -hmm. loans programme. Having said that, we haven't stopped the loans programme, so loans is still happening to museums. So when people are actually coming to us um, asking to borrow objects, we're still having those conversations and we're still loaning. So we haven't turned down any key asks. If they're strategically and nationally important to organisation, it's still happening. But it's just the, the pause is helping our team really look at what we've got on loan both ways in and out so hopefully it gets in a good position but we're not actually saying no to every loan request i know the oak is in good hands out in it's in good hands doesn't it look great yeah, there fantastic. that's a yeah. pima it's uh, looking fabulous with their two-seater one yes. as well super i may even put that little video that i did with andy in the middle of this episode yeah. there we go. it's be, great it it's great yeah. and and you know and, and you know and it is back to Oh, we have that massively big responsibility to hold the national collection of the RAF. Mm -hmm. And actually, that should be seen and enjoyed more than in just two sites. So actually, the LOMS programme is really important. And we did an, a proactive, did a, offered proactive loans last year for the first time. Sadly, not much uptake mm -hmm. on it. Um, to, to actually go, you know, if, you know, if it's going to either be in store here then isn't it better if it's on display somewhere else mm -hmm. in another organisation? And actually, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, our, our national collection should be on display throughout the UK yeah. and abroad for more people. So, so it is great to have an opportunity to do that as well. And the archive as well is, is reopening as well, which, yes. is, which is great. I know it's popular because it's impossible to get a seat into yeah. it. So... I guess that's going to be ramping up. That's one of the, the parts that's in there is that the access to that. Oh, it's a massive priority and, it, you know, it isn't as accessible as we want it to be. Mm. So that is an absolute priority uh, in terms of opening up more now what we've got, which isn't in the greater space up those stairs. It isn't the, you know, physically as mm. accessible as we'd like now. Um, uh, and, and again, that's in, but that is something that's going to be right at the end of the period of strategy 2030 in terms of our relocating it still at Hendon but relocating it and making a better reading room a more you know purposeful fit for the future better space although there is something delightful about the current one because it feels like you're in a an archive room but actually it's not a great space it, it's not brilliantly accessible so I mean in the in the the medium to longer term we really would like to Movie, so it's more physically accessible. But now it's about getting the one that we've got open more hours and, and out there for people. So a bit of a jump plan, as well as digitisation, of course. Yes, that, that was the next bit. Because yeah. for those that can't get here, being able yeah. to access elements of it there, that's yeah. all. But yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, again, actually, it's something our trustees are really keen on as well and uh, a, a real priority for us. But, of course, it takes time and money and people to do that but we've you know the team are cracking on with it so the air ministry day summaries to twenty thousand pages of them are done now they're just being indexed at the moment so we hope they go out soon we've got the trenchard archive which yeah. fabulously we were gifted in the christmas of 2020 from the trenchard family fabulously making good strides with that so at the moment the, the team are prioritising the historically important collections to get out and on there first. So it's work in progress. It takes time. Um, but I'm really keen to look if we can shift some more resources around so we can accelerate that a bit more because it's going to take too long if we carry on at the same pace, frankly. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear because there's 
There's so much great stuff in there. Oh, it's, a, uh, it's an amazing, yeah. amazing resource. And I want to come and play more often. And yeah. I, and, I, and I can't get a seat either. But speaking of new acquisitions, mm. the, the big one over the last year was the fundraising for the Scarf VC. Yes. Which was successful. Successful. Which we can't see. On display. It's in Hangar 5. No, no, it's on display in Hangar 1. Did I walk past yeah, it? Yeah, in yeah. that case, I was going to pop oh, over Oh, see, it's on your way out, please. Yes. So in, in time, yeah. we will move it into Hangar 5 mm -hmm. with the rest of the collection there. But as a new acquisition, it's in there in Hangar 1 when, when you come in. So I looked at anyway. photo reconnaissance cameras and a rocket, which would go on a typhoon. Mm -hmm. And then we met Harry, so I wanted to... Oh, I yeah. should pop, so I should it's pop on display there, there. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. there to see. So, so that, that was... Just, Quite a large public campaign. Yeah. What sort of the the memories from it now that it's here? Is, Crikey. As well? yeah. yeah, it's a great question because it is always that, you know, we have our strategy 2030, we have our priorities, we've got a massive fundraising goal for our Midlands side, and then something comes left field <laughs> uh, that actually, that it's a phenomenal amount of money that is uh, you're thinking, well, you know, how does that now fit into our already full priorities. And we keep saying, you know, every year with our business planning, try and full our business plan to 85% so we've got a bit of wriggle room instead. Mm -hmm. And of course, we never do. We always over. So of course, then something like that happens. And it's what do we do? And it's only the second time that I've been involved in something that's been export stock. So I did it with a beautiful bronze medieval jug a few years ago. Um, and it is a really tricky one because how do you as an organisation go... How, you know, is it the right thing to jump off and do that with a large amount of money for a metal bar? But, you know, there is, it was, it was export stopped mm -hmm. because it's of national significance. Yeah. And that, that says an awful lot. It was, you know, its story, Arthur Scar's mm -hmm. story is immense. And it was the only, um, it, it was the only one, one in the Far East for the RAF, so it tells a different story, and a remarkable story of, of um, heroism and res re responding to the, uh, you know, part of the RAF story. So how do you then balance, all, back to how do you balance all those priorities? And actually the fact that it's of national significance, there's a clue in our name as the Royal Air Force Museum. It, 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 it almost felt that if we didn't, it would be the wrong thing to do reputationally and in terms of, you know, as a tribute to an individual who did something amazing. So I got the team together, actually, and in fact, I was away at the time um, at a conference, got the team together virtually to go, do you know what, if we go for this, it is going to be work for a lot of people. And we, you know, as a team, we've got to think about this. And it came to, uh, you know, in terms of the fundraising, um, we'll, we, we won't try and cannibalise places where we'll go to for the Midlands. Mm -hmm. There are there are specific, you know, places we go, but it is a lot of time a national campaign. But it is significant nationally. That's why it's export stopped and all the team went, we'll pull together and go for it. And actually, of course, it, it's, it, it is an incredible object and it did us a lot of good because a lot of um, specialist people who really care um, were very, very positive about that and you know it, it's really tricky at the end of the day it's what do we do and what I said to the team is look it's an awful lot of money to raise we might not do it and we've all got to be prepared to fail mm -hmm. but actually it's the trying that 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 is important so we need to show that we respect this as an important part of our AF history and try and if we don't get there we've tried and there's no dishonour in that and we did it hurrah it was a phenomenal amount of money. Phenomenal. Yeah. And I, I suppose I, I was guilty as well. I, I looked at the money figure and yeah. was worried that there would be funds being diverted yeah. from the cost of things. That, yeah. that wasn't It wasn't the, the case, case at all. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're very welcome to ask about the money. It's not um, yeah. a hidden thing. So, and we were, and the, the funder, the key funder for anything like that, that's objects uh, that's um, export stopped as a cultural object is the National Heritage Memorial Fund, mm -hmm. which is a fantastic um, fund that is there as a sort of last resort for last, you know, yeah. for, to, to save objects of, of national importance. So um, a key chunk of funding came from there. Um, and then 
uh, some trusts and foundations were amazing. But do you know what hurt me was we were looking every day. You could, you know, you watch it. And mm. I became obsessed with checking every day. You know, people putting in a fiver meant, meant almost as much as the massive grants coming through because people were saying, our history is important to me. And it really gave us heart. All those, all those individual contributions were really um, motivating and a really emotional push for us that we've, we've got to do this. It was actually the thought of not doing it because we'd chosen a platform that would be slightly easier to um, give all that money back if we didn't get there. Because obviously that's yeah. something really important you've got oh, to think yeah. about as well. But the thought of giving all that back when people have been so generous was just, yeah. So it, it, was, it was amazing and really humbling, actually. And I walked straight past it. It's terrible. I need to go visit it on the way out. Please do. Will do. Yeah. So... You've been very generous with your time. I have. A Sorry, I've talked too much. No, no, it's it was the tea lubricating. It is, well, get you more tea, we'll keep going. What do you hope your legacy is going to be? Mm, I struggle with a bit with the word legacy as a human. You know, it feels like it's a bit of a, you know, it's not my oh, gig. It's okay, let, let, let's, but, uh, let's rephrase the question. Leave behind. Well, yeah. What, what do you want people to think of you when, when you've gone? That sounds well, even no, worse. I don't, I don't, <laughs> do you know what? I'd rather not do the personal bit, but go in terms of what the museum will be like yeah. and the, you know, the, perhaps the, yeah. I, I think it is back to that, that, that all these people from, you know, locally who've come far away, just come and find something that they go away and feel emotionally connected to and inspired by. Mm -hmm. And of course, increasing the visitor figures is, I mean, we, you know, we've gone from 700,000 a year before 2018, I think we're going to hit 900 this year after COVID. And, you know, which is, and I am really proud of that. Uh, uh, but th that is a massive team effort. That, that isn't me, that is the team mm -hmm. and how they care about sharing that story. But it, is, it isn't just about numbers of people through the door. It's the fact that we've broadened the, the sorts of people that come into the museum and it's about what they take away with them and for me. So it is about that connection. Super. Maggie, thank you so much for spending the last little while with us. Thank you. It was lovely to have you and share some tea. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we, we can have a biscuit now, so we're not yeah. crunching today. <laughs> To get an hour and a half of a National Museum CEO's time when they just had a flood was incredibly generous. And I can't thank the staff at the RAF Museum for helping to set up this interview. I can't thank Maggie enough for having the patience to put up with my questions and be as open and honest as she was. It was a fantastic conversation and it was a pure delight. Thanks again to Scott Marchand at the Pima Air and Space Museum for making the introductions. And thank you for your continued support of the podcast, because it's your support that means we can do these interviews with people that normally don't get out and about to playing geeks and people who visit these museums, because the sites here in London and the Midlands, Hendon and Cosford as were, are really, really impressive places. They're not what they used to be. And I think we've discussed that to death today to understand why they need to change. So the old Battle of Britain hangar that we all loved back in the day is no longer there. But Hangar 1 is a fantastic way to get introduced to the story of the RAF. And even though I did walk past the Scarf VC, I did return to see it. And it is beautifully displayed there in Hangar 1. It'll look even better when it finally makes its way over to the newly repaired and ready to go Hangar 5. Cosford is immense. It, the Cold War exhibit up there is just huge with aircraft all over the place and of course they have what's left of the enemy aircraft collection as well so if you ever want to see an me 410 that is your place to go she's amazing the tempest 2 is up there post restoration she's fantastic little aside but once again thank you to maggie for taking the time to answer all my questions i have hoped you've enjoyed this we're going to try to do this a little bit more with other museums especially if i can get out and about now that the move and most of the painting is done in the new house as always, your support makes these things happen. So continue to tell your friends, pop stars in your podcast app of choice. It does help. The algorithms work off those things. And as always to our AI overlords, 
please share the podcast. Of course, if you want to get a little bit more involved, we have our Patreon, which starts at just £3 a month, plus the VAT. On there, you got all these episodes early, different intro, outros, no ads, and all that good stuff. I'm going to start putting to the Patreon people who we've called the Damcasters, and by we, I mean me, if they want to ask questions to our guests, which means I've got to be a little bit more prepared to get those questions out. So over the next few episodes that I don't already have recorded, uh, you might start hearing that. So it could be fun if you have questions for some of our upcoming guests you'll hear about it first on patreon and i'll be picking and choosing the best questions to ask because in the past when i've done this the damn castiers have had better questions than me not bitter about that at all so like i said check the link below all the links in the description for the rf museum sites and socials are there i've also popped my history hack hedge hopping days episode um, of chris sams and i's visit up to the michael beetham conservation center a couple of years ago where we chatted with darren priday about all things early bomber command the wellington the hamden and of course the fantastic donia that they pulled out of the channel until next time everybody thank you so much for your incredible support and as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.